My name is Clarence Larson, and I am director of the Pioneers of Science and Technology videotape project. The first part of this is an experiment which I am going to give some of my biographical uh, information starting essentially from the time I was born in 1909 in the town of Cloquet, uh, Minnesota, which is in the northern part of the state near Lake Superior. My earliest recollection of any happenings, and many psychologists and uh, uh, st students of uh, child uh, psychology will dispute this, is a vague recollection of my mother taking me in her arms outside and pointing to something which was a light. And vaguely, in my in later years, I tended to associate that with the uh, appearance of Halley's Comet in 1910. Uh, theoretically, this was too young for any uh, such memory to exist, but I just recite this uh, as an interesting uh, background, because now, next year, we are faced with the return of uh, Halley's Comet. Uh, my early childhood was really quite uneventful. Our town was a homogeneous town, uh, primarily devoted to uh, uh, lumber manufacture and uh, paper manufacture, and slightly later, it was uh, devoted somewhat to uh, the manufacture of uh, insulation. In fact, I believe the first manufactured insulation uh, was made of uh, uh, fiber uh, wood, which is placed uh, between two sandwiches, which gave an insulating property for uh, the uh, insulation of uh, houses. The, uh, my first recollection of a big event in my life was the so-called Big Fire of 1918. The fall of 1918, which incidentally was the, uh, the, the last of World War I, was a very, very dry summer, and the woods were tinder dry. And, uh, of course, that brings on the possibility of very serious uh, forest fires, because at that time, Minnesota was a lush growth of uh, timber. Well, surely enough, a large forest fire broke out, and uh, uh, within a day, our town was uh, endangered. Uh, we, uh, uh, when we saw the fire uh, coming, and we had also heard reports uh, uh, from the train crews coming through of the serious fires uh, uh, down below us, uh, whereby a town of about 500 was completely wiped out with great loss of life. And as the fire approached our town, all of us were able to escape uh, due to the foresight of a uh, uh, train dispatcher who held all of the trains coming through, including box cars, coal cars, passenger trains, any form of transportation that was available uh, was held so that uh, we could evacuate the entire town of uh, 10,000 within a, a few hours. I dealt even with our uh, uh, modern planning and everything that uh, you could have arranged such an efficient evacuation with no loss of life uh, uh, during that short a period of time. At the time I was nine years old, and of course to this day I have a vivid recollection of the a tremendous windstorm, which uh, of course was the characteristic uh, of uh, the firestorm, uh, the wind being uh, actually generated by the tremendous uh, fires that were uh, 
uh, that broke out. As you can readily see, this was a very traumatic uh, time uh, with the, uh, the entire town uh, being evacuated and sent to Duluth and Superior over the rails. At that time, uh, there were practically no automobiles uh, uh, in existence in our hometown. Perhaps maybe five or six automobiles uh, were uh, in existence. The roads were very poor, uh, sort of one and a half lane roads between uh, Cloquet and Duluth. And unfortunately, those people who did try to get away by car were burned to death uh, because they were caught uh, on the road by the uh, fires. So uh, fortunately, uh, practically the whole town was saved uh, being evacuated to Duluth and Superior. Uh, temporarily, uh, we were brought to uh, uh, centers, uh, school gymnasiums, civic centers, and places like that. And the people of Duluth and Superior were mobilized and took uh, them, took uh, each one of the uh, families who volunteered, took one family from Cloquet. And so we were temporarily quartered in people's homes in Duluth and uh, Superior. An outpouring a uh, real generosity on the part uh, of the people. Now, I'll never forget the cordial reception we had uh, from the people of uh, Superior, uh, Wisconsin. Well, following that, to make a long story short, uh, we did uh, rebuild the uh, uh, city of uh, Cloquet. At first, we lived in temporary housing and then built a uh, permanent house uh, which stands to this state and which I visited uh, just uh, last year. The uh, uh, following that, uh, it was about time for me to uh, go to high school, and there was nothing particularly uh, uh, outstanding uh, in high school. Uh, before I went to high school. Uh, I had the opportunity to participate in a, an educational experiment. We hear of all kinds of educational experiments today, and uh, uh, this was uh, no exception. They gave all of us a test in the sixth grade, and if we scored high enough, uh, there were, I think, 25 of us selected to go into a special class which would uh, study both 7th and 8th grade subjects uh, together. This included uh, math and, uh, well, of course, was advanced arithmetic, and uh, algebra, uh, literature, uh, writing, and uh, some history. And uh, most notably, great emphasis was uh, put on spelling. And at the end of that time, uh, it was a... Uh, time to give us uh, uh, examinations. And these examinations were not trivial. The examinations from the seventh grade on through the finish of high school at that time were conducted by the state education department so that in order for us to go into high school, we were forced to take state-generated uh, uh, tests in both seventh and eighth grade subjects and pass both of them in order to receive credit. Well, as a result of this experiment, four of us uh, passed into uh, uh, high school uh, and the rest of them had some uh, deficiencies which they had to uh, make up before they could be full uh, term freshmen. But four of us made it uh, into the regular high school classes and uh, therefore I was one year ahead. As a result, uh, uh, when I, uh, I went to uh, uh, went into my senior year, I was 15 uh, starting my uh, senior year. So I graduated quite uh, early. 
Now, during uh, particularly my freshman and sophomore year, and perhaps even uh, in the eighth grade, I became very interested in electricity, and I read every book in the library on the subject, uh, and uh, I decided to perform some experiments, so we rigged up uh, a little telegraph line uh, between uh, my home and uh, uh, some of my friends uh, and neighbors, and we were able to uh, uh, communicate uh, back and forth uh, uh, through these uh, lines. We made the telegraph ourselves, wound our own coils. Uh, in order to get the uh, battery power, uh, we scrounged around the uh, Bell Telephone uh, a discard pile, and they used to use batteries in the phones in those days, and uh, the used batteries uh, had enough uh, electricity, electric power, uh, energy left in them so that uh, we could use them for this uh, purpose by connecting them in series and, uh, and parallel. So we had a great deal of fun with this. And then shortly after, I became interested in uh, uh, wireless. And uh, at that particular time, uh, in 1920 and 21, uh, it was actually before the days of uh, uh, broadcasting, I believe broadcasting started around 1921, and uh, as a generator of uh, radio frequency signals, we used the uh, uh, a spark gap. And my source of the spark gap was a Ford spark coil, which I connected to batteries and generated about a half inch spark. Connected that to an antenna, and we were able to actually. Uh, signal uh, as far away as about one and a half miles uh, uh, using this setup. So I became interested in uh, electronics and uh, electricity at a, uh, at a very early age. Uh, during my high school year, strangely enough, I had not really intended to uh, uh, go away to uh, college. Remember, this was back in 1924, 1925, and 26, and in our hometown, uh, a very small percentage of the uh, graduates went on to college, and I uh, did not expect actually to uh, to do so. Uh, uh, in spite of the fact I got reasonably good uh, good grades, uh, uh, I was not at the top of my class uh, or anything. And so I uh, uh, decided uh, after I graduated uh, that uh, I would uh, attempt to get some sort of a job uh, and then work up from there. Most people, uh, my brothers, had both uh, obtained uh, jobs at the uh, lumber and paper companies there in town, and I thought I would follow along the uh, same path. Uh, and. Uh, However, I was given the opportunity to uh, uh, to do uh, boys' work uh, at the local YMCA, and strangely enough, I was offered uh, for those days quite a handsome salary in order to uh, uh, in order to do this. So, as a 16-year-old, uh, I uh, became uh, full-time employee uh, as assistant uh, YMCA secretary for boys work. Uh, I, I got this uh, job particularly because I was uh, actually uh, very interested in uh, the Bible at that time, in fact read considerably, and uh, I was active in uh, the uh, youth groups in the church and so on. And uh, although I never thought about it particularly, I suppose that was why I happened to uh, uh, get this job. Well, as a result uh, of this, uh, I was uh, uh, given the opportunity to uh, participate in uh, organizing uh, boys tournaments and basketball and uh, uh, soccer and uh, tennis and uh, all kinds of uh, activities of uh, this type, 
and uh, uh, also uh, occasionally, uh, since the YMCA was uh, religious oriented, I was called upon occasionally to uh, serve as a substitute minister uh, in some of the small churches in the rural communities. And uh, so I uh, would occasionally go out and actually uh, give the service and, uh, and the sermon uh, uh, at that time. As a matter of fact, I think I still could today uh, give the sermon I gave uh, at that time, which was my favorite one, um, and with the uh, title of uh, Taken from the Bible, and Jacob's Well was there, which uh, has the theme, of course, that the fact that uh, Jacob had uh, done uh, some very fine work in drilling that well, uh, he uh, digging that well, he, uh, people for generations afterwards benefited from the work that he did during his lifetime. And so I think there was a very fine uh, moral uh, lesson to that. And uh, uh, it was, uh, I, as I say, I still can remember that particular uh, uh, sermon that I gave. Well, as time went on and I read more and more, I became more interested in uh, the possibility of going to college and of course, actually, probably about as soon as I started the job, I uh, began to think perhaps if I saved my money, I would be able to actually uh, uh, go away and uh, get, uh, get an education uh, in college. So I uh, saved uh, a reasonable amount of money and uh, with some trepidation, I uh, decided to quit my job, which incidentally by that time was paying uh, for those days uh, uh, an enormous salary. I believe it was $125 a month, uh, uh, which was a uh, very, uh, uh, very good salary. And uh, uh, enrolled at the university and uh, took the usual uh, courses. I had become interested in chemistry, so I thought that I would uh, end up then perhaps uh, as a uh, uh, chemistry teacher after I graduated from college. But as I grew more and more interested as I went through college, uh, I <coughs> decided that uh, I, if I could, I would go on to graduate work uh, or perhaps uh, work in industry. And I <coughs> grew less and less uh, interested in uh, education courses. As a matter of fact, I became very bored with uh, the education courses and, uh, and uh, did not like them at all compared to the scientific, uh, mathematical, and technical courses that I uh, took. So as an upshot, uh, to make a long story short again, uh, I graduated in the depth of the Depression. This was 1932 and not a member of my graduating class uh, in chemistry received a job offer. Uh, and uh, with the exception of one man who uh, got an offer from his uh, uncle who, home, who owned a small chemical plant. So uh, I was fortunate in getting a uh, fellowship at the University of California and decided to uh, uh, moved to California. Uh, my mother was quite tearful about this, moving so far away, but I re really enjoyed the uh, challenge and looked forward to it. And uh, journeyed to uh, California, uh, where I uh, did my graduate work. This was in uh, 1932. And uh, as I lived through those graduate years, I did not realize uh, what a revolution in science was uh, beginning to occur uh, right around me. Uh, the, uh, it was at that time, uh, actually in 1932, that E.O. Lawrence uh, uh, invented the uh, cyclotron, and of course I uh, naturally was conscious of it, but I did not have the full realization of the revolution that that made in physics. Uh, my work, of course, was in uh, chemistry, 
and uh, uh, my uh, some of my work that I did involved the uh, chemical, physical chemical properties of biologically important compounds, and uh, uh, as a result, I studied the electrochemistry of uh, these compounds, its behavior in electric fields uh, determined uh, the electrode potentials of various systems and uh, had uh, uh, learned, uh, learned a great deal, uh, uh, in addition to chemistry, uh, learned a great deal about electrochemistry, which was to uh, serve me in good stead uh, uh, later on. Well, to make a long, again, a long story short, I was uh, uh, finally uh, received my uh, PhD, and uh, by that time, of course, uh, there were two avenues open to me. One, I could go into research work, and uh, the other, I would go into uh, teaching. Uh, my, uh, as a matter of fact, I received a full-time research uh, uh, assistantship uh, at the Mount Zion Research Foundation, uh, uh, almost co coincident with finishing up my thesis work uh, for my PhD degree. And so I, uh, I did research work for uh, a year and uh, learned about an opportunity for, a, uh, uh, for an instructorship uh, at the uh, College of the Pacific uh, at that time, and uh, I was uh, <coughs> um, very pleased to do this because I actually felt that uh, college teaching would be an ideal life. You could do some research work, and also I uh, always uh, did enjoy uh, uh, teaching, particularly at the elementary uh, college level, and. Uh, so uh, uh, I did obtain uh, the uh, position. Uh, I found out later that there were actually 100 applicants uh, for this position. I didn't realize at the time how lucky I was to uh, actually uh, obtain the position. I uh, found out uh, later when I became head of the department uh, that uh, those uh, applications were uh, on file. Uh, so I glanced through them, and I must say that I never could quite figure out why they hired me rather than some of the very well-qualified people uh, that, they, uh, uh, that they had. But at any rate, uh, I was very happy to obtain the position. And my years of uh, teaching there at the college were very happy years. Uh, I think that the uh, combination of a small liberal arts college uh, together with small classes uh, forms an, an ideal situation. In addition to that, I did have uh, a little opportunity to do uh, some research work. And uh, since my uh, work uh, in graduate school, uh, brought me into uh, touch with the marvelous developments going on in, uh, uh, in the field of uh, development of artificial radioactivity, the application of the cyclotron to radioactivity. Uh, I did not actually participate in that because I was so busy trying to iron out my own research projects, but uh, uh, I can remember distinctly uh, one uh, attending a lecture given by uh, Dr. John Lawrence, the brother of E.O. Lawrence, uh, in which uh, he demonstrated uh, the uh, uh, the radio uh, the uh, absorption of uh, radioactive tracers. And uh, they had uh, produced some radioactive sodium in the cyclotron and dissolved it in uh, water and uh, mixed it with perhaps some lemonade or something. And they had, uh, as a demonstration, they had one of the uh, workers there 
drink the radioactive uh, sodium, which is in the form of sodium chloride, and then uh, they had a Geiger counter on, uh, on the finger, which was extended away from the Geiger counter. And perhaps within about two or three minutes, uh, the Geiger counter began to click from the radioactive sodium, which was absorbed uh, into the bloodstream and then circulated all the way to the uh, fingertips. It was a very interesting uh, uh, demonstration <coughs> of the use of uh, tracers uh, in uh, biology. Well, uh, as a result of some of the, uh, uh, I had made uh, a casual acquaintance with uh, E.O. Lawrence and, uh, and, other, and some others on the staff, and uh, was able to uh, uh, get some radioactive uh, tracer material uh, by uh, taking the, uh, uh, the targets which held their uh, uh, main experiments, and there was always a little stray radiation uh, hitting the targets, and uh, I was able to uh, uh, get the targets which contained radioactive uh, iron and cobalt and manganese, uh, and uh, I was able then to uh, do elementary experiments in, uh, in the use of uh, radioactive tracers involving uh, iron, chromium, uh, and manganese. Uh, at that time, I used the uh, Lauritsen electroscope instead of the Geiger counter because the Geiger counter was still in the very elementary stages, uh, but the Lauritsen Electroscope, uh, uh, which was a, a modification of the uh, gold leaf electroscope that Madame Curie had uh, used way back in the na about 1905, and, uh, and, and uh, this was a special uh, one with an optical scale back of it, which made the readings easier, but the principle was actually the same. Uh, I've spoken to Dr. Glenn Seaborg, and he used the, uh, the Lauritsen electroscope. And more recently, I've talked to Phil Aberson, and he used the Lauritsen electroscope. So these very simple, uh, cheap uh, uh, devices uh, can be used for a very fine uh, research work. Uh, one of the things I tried to do at that time was to uh, uh, use the radioactive uh, tracer chromium uh, as an analytical uh, tool for the determination of, uh, of uh, sulfate in very low concentrations. And uh, uh, this uh, I was unable to do satisfactorily because of the very low level of uh, of chromium uh, activity I was able to get. Uh, over 15 years later, when radioactive chromium became available, I did go into the laboratory uh, when I was director of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory and finish up that experiment and actually publish the uh, uh, results uh, using uh, chromium as a method for determination of the sulfates. It was a rather trivial thing but I did this more or less to satisfy my ego, perhaps. Well, at any rate, uh, uh, as a result of these experiments uh, that I was doing uh, in, uh, at the College of the Pacific, uh, and I did have some very fine uh, students there, uh, and I enjoyed the work uh, very well, uh, very much, but uh, uh, historical events, uh, did uh, overtake us. Uh, I can remember distinctly, uh, of course, uh, uh, one of the things uh, beginning in about 1938 was the peace movement on the campuses of uh, all of the colleges in the country. And our uh, particular uh, college was no different. We had a very uh, powerful uh, peace movement the students were very enthusiastic about it. At the time, of course, Hitler was uh, becoming more and more powerful, more and more threatening. You could see the war clouds gathering in Europe 
and uh, this was uh, uh, alarmed everyone, and everyone was very anxious to preserve peace. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, those of us who had studied history could see that uh, uh, the uh, peace movements were not going to be able to stop uh, Hitler. Uh, at any rate, uh, I can distinctly remember the leader of uh, uh, the peace movement, who happened to be uh, one of the uh, students uh, that I served as an advisor. Each one of us were assigned a certain number of students to uh, advise on courses, and sign approvals to take courses, and so on. And he explained with great uh, uh, with great earnestness the uh, demonstration that they were uh, organizing. This was in 1938, uh, as to uh, the worldwide peace movement. It was actually to be held at this football stadium there in uh, at the college. Uh, they had one of the uh, bishop, high bishops of the church to serve as the main speaker and the students were uh, all organized to uh, give demonstrations with banners and, and so forth against uh, against war and it was a uh, it was a marvelous demonstration that they uh, that they put on it was very sad therefore that if just a few years later Upon, uh, as uh, with of course within a few months, war broke out in Europe, and uh, then later on, of course, uh, we did have uh, 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 we did have the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And oddly enough, those students who were so active and so earnest in the peace movement, overnight became very patriotic and were the first ones to volunteer uh, to uh, uh, fight for our country. And uh, so I think there's a, there's a very uh, good illustration about how history repeats itself. Uh, and uh, because in England, we had the same thing happen. I remember talking to some people uh, who, uh, uh, who had uh, equivalent experience with the uh, earnest students who were in the peace movement at Oxford and Cambridge were among the first to uh, volunteer uh, for, uh, uh, for flying in the RAF and were uh, perhaps the leaders in the, uh, the great fight, uh, fight in the Battle of Britain. But to come back to... Uh, uh, as soon as the war broke out, of course, things were changed entirely. The college was converted uh, very much to preliminary training for uh, the uh, uh, the Air Force, uh, which was being expanded at the time. And uh, we were all uh, asked to beef up uh, our uh, courses. I uh, taught... Uh, uh, modified math courses for uh, uh, students uh, going into the uh, Air Force. Uh, and uh, uh, as I say, uh, things were beginning to completely change around. Uh, actually, a, a few years uh, earlier uh, in my classes, uh, there was an event which took place uh, uh, which uh, which was a uh, very uh, uh, very significant. Uh, I believe it was in early 1939 uh, that we had uh, uh, our uh, courses uh, in chemistry, and uh, one of our most popular activities was a Monday afternoon seminar in which uh, uh, we would uh, take uh, one given topic and assign it to uh, a student uh, and he would read up on it 
and then report on recent advances. Uh, and uh, then we would uh, uh, cover uh, uh, all of the uh, uh, topics of immediate interest in the, in the field of chemistry. And then this one uh, day, uh, there came out uh, this report uh, from Germany about the uh, work of Hahn and Strassmann in uh, the uh, discovering that uh, with the absorption of uh, neutrons that uh, uranium uh, uh, was split approximately in half, uh, uh, giving rise to uh, radioisotopes. And this was a nuclear reaction which had not even been dreamed of, which uh, had never uh, had never occurred to people that it could possibly be. In fact, uh, the neutrons had been used to bombard uranium uh, uh, in many of the most prominent uh, laboratories of the world. Uh, Fermi in Rome, the Curies in Paris, Hahn and Strassmann uh, uh, in, uh, in Germany, and in the United States there were several uh, laboratories. All of them uh, bombarded the uranium, but none of them recognized uh, the fact that in the large number of the hits of uranium, of neutrons on uranium, that there was a splitting of uh, the atom. Almost all of them thought that uh, the uranium was absorbing the neutron and becoming, instead of uh, uh, uranium-238, it would become uh, uh, uranium-239, which would uh, actually then perhaps become, become a transuranic. In fact, Fermi had postulated uh, the existence of several isotopes of uh, uh, elements 93 and perhaps of 94. And by mistake, uh, he had actually been awarded the Nobel Prize uh, uh, in physics, I believe it was in 1937 or 1938, uh, uh, because of a mistaken uh, uh, diagnosis that that of what was uh, happening. Of course, his tremendous work uh, in the field of physics and, and actually uh, his methods that he, development of the methods he used fully, he fully deserved the Nobel Prize for many other things besides that. But it was really interesting that he was mistaken in his uh, interpretation. Well, as soon as that was published, uh, our little group uh, uh, of our chemistry seminars, we uh, we had uh, we had some sort of a topic uh, involved, uh, something like ion exchange resins, which were beginning to be made at that time, uh, and we uh, discarded that topic and discussed the implications of uh, the splitting of the atom, and whereas people had postulated that they could tap the energy of the atom eventually and give us an un, unlimited supply. This was uh, the first uh, time that we were actually able to uh, postulate a practical way in which the energy of the atom uh, could be uh, tapped. Well, later on we find that, uh, I, I found that uh, as the war, uh, when the war broke out, uh, as things changed, and uh, I uh, uh, received a call from Berkeley to come down uh, and uh, be interviewed for a uh, uh, for some new project that was uh, being uh, uh, being uh, mobilized there, and so uh, E.O. Lawrence uh, was. Uh, mounting this very uh, secret project. In fact, I, uh, I really didn't know what I was being called down there for until uh, I actually joined the project. 
During the interview, I was given no hint whatsoever uh, as to what the project was. Uh, it was only that uh, the project uh, uh, was extremely uh, important and that it would be vital to the war effort and uh, that uh, my particular uh, uh, work would fit in uh, very well uh, to the project. So I decided uh, to uh, resign or take a leave of absence in 1942 and join the, uh, uh, join the project at the, the University of California. All right. Well, now with regard to joining the project at Berkeley, my first uh, job there after receiving some slight indoctrination, at which time I was told uh, what the project uh, was. And I can remember very distinctly in talking to E.O. Lawrence about the time schedule. He said it is absolutely necessary that the uh, project be finished up uh, by July of 1945 and it would be necessary to have uh, roughly uh, 100 kilograms of the product uh, produced uh, by that particular time. Now, this doesn't seem like very much, but uh, this was in July of 1942, and the process uh, by which this U-235 was to be produced was the electromagnetic process, which uh, essentially was a large mass spectrograph uh, and in which the atoms of uh, uranium uh, were uh, vaporized, ionized in an arc, accelerated, and then bent in a magnetic field, and uh, at the end of 180 degrees travel would be collected in uh, two uh, separate small boxes, one containing in theory, the U-235, and the other box containing the U-238. At the time I joined the project in 1942, uh, uh, there had been produced uh, uh, somewhat on the order of a milligram or two of uh, the U-235 uh, fraction. So you can see there was a long way to go in order to get uh, this produced. Well, the first, my first job was uh, to uh, distill the uranium tetrachloride, which was the charge material uh, for this uh, process, and uh, uh, to uh, distill it and sublime it in a pure form so that it then could be used to uh, put uh, in the uh, source uh, to be ionized. This was no mean job uh, because it involved distilling under high vacuum and under uh, carefully controlled temperature conditions. And uh, it was uh, a very uh, a difficult uh, process. Uh, and had to be done under absolutely vacuum tight preparation for the uh, actual distillation and following that the unloading had to be done inside of dry boxes to avoid any possibility of moisture because moisture hydrolyzed the highly hygroscopic UCL4 and uh, then would destroy its usefulness. Well, we managed to get uh, enough of this uh, prepared and uh, actually work out a, uh, uh, a method for uh, preparing it on reasonably large scale. So my next uh, project 
was to turn uh, our attention to uh, methods for recycling the uranium uh, uh, in the process. It turns out that uh, uh, whereas the uh, process sounds very simple, uh, in practice it's not very simple. The uranium uh, uh, tetrachloride uh, is vaporized <coughs> uh, and then is ionized in an arc uh, and then led into the uh, collectors containing uh, theoretically the U-235 and the U-238. Unfortunately, the ionization uh, is very, uh, very incomplete and uh, so uh, only 5 to 10 percent of the uh, uranium which is vaporized gets into the ionic stream and then uh, the rest of it collects on the walls of the uh, uh, containers and so that had to be washed down thoroughly uh, uh, thoroughly collected because uranium was very valuable and then it had to be precipitated recovered as the uranium oxide and then converted to uranium tetrachloride, purified again, uh, and then uh, go through the whole cycle. So this got to be very complicated, and there was a great premium on getting as high a recovery as uh, possible, uh, because uranium was uh, reasonably uh, scarce, at least there were certainly none to be uh, uh, wasted, and uh, therefore, uh, this had to be done uh, with, uh, with great care. Well, we worked out a passable uh, method for doing this, and, uh, and the recycling uh, turned out uh, to be uh, practical. Uh, we did uh, some of these experiments uh, uh, in uh, the 37-inch cyclotron in Berkeley, and tested our methods for recovery and, uh, uh, and uh, worked it out uh, on a small cyclotron uh, uh, which was converted into a mass spectrograph uh, and we had uh, a good uh, research tool to carry out uh, all of our uh, experiments. Well, the, uh, uh, this went on and uh, the, the method which was being used was uh, not all that satisfactory because uh, in, in theory, uh, if you have pure uranium salts, uh, this works out very well. But uranium tetrachloride uh, uh, is a very corrosive uh, uh, material and any metal that it comes in contact with uh, is immediately corroded and uh, uh, actually dissolves the iron and steel and if they're stainless steel it would dissolve some of the chromium off uh, uh, if there are nickel parts uh, they dissolve some of the nickel and so in general you ended up with uh, a small amount of uranium and a large amount of impurities uh, to be recycled and this complicated uh, the uh, the actual process uh, uh, considerably, in fact, led to great difficulty, as we'll see a little later uh, in the actual process. Uh, while this was going on, uh, uh, it uh, seemed to me that the ideal thing to do, instead of trying to uh, uh, separate out by uh, certain agents, the iron, chromium, nickel, and all the rest of these things, and then leaving the uranium in solution that uh, uh, that it would be much better to do it the other way around precipitate out the uh, uranium and then uh, leave the uh, uh, the rest of the things in uh, solution uh, this was a good idea but there was no agent known which would precipitate out uh, uh, uranium uh, away from everything else uh, except one agent uh, which is hydrogen peroxide and it turns out that uh, uranium 
is precipitated by hydrogen peroxide to form uranium peroxide uh, almost uh, quantitatively under the right conditions and uh, so it, it, uh, it seemed that we had uh, actually uh, discovered the uh, best possible way to do this. One complication, however, was that uh, peroxide is very unstable uh, in the presence of certain metals, particularly iron. In fact, iron actually decomposes the peroxide catalytically. And uh, for those of you who uh, remember the early days of medicine, we used hydrogen peroxide to sterilize uh, cuts and uh, you had a, the impression that the hydrogen peroxide uh, uh, was working because it bubbled and fizzed. Actually, this was uh, uh, because of the presence of certain enzymes in the blood and perhaps some iron, which decomposed peroxide immediately. So that in our solutions, we had a lot of iron in it, there was no possibility of using this reaction because the iron uh, catalytically uh, decomposed the peroxide. Well, this puzzled uh, me a lot, and I uh, decided to uh, eliminate the uh, iron by complexing it with certain agents. There was uh, uh, complexing agents which uh, would tie up the iron and make it unavailable for catalytic purposes. Uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, there was such a variety, I could, uh, uh, some of which are even used today uh, in uh, certain uh, processes. But uh, the net effect was that they were all very expensive, all very scarce, and they didn't work all uh, too well anyhow. And so uh, I finally had to abandon that approach, and uh, it was uh, assumed that we really couldn't do it until I hit on a uh, on an idea which uh, was probably a throwback to some of the research work that I uh, did at one time. In my research work on biological compounds, uh, I found that uh, they, uh, many of the organic compounds uh, were unstable, uh, particularly if heated slightly, and even in some solutions they were unstable, and so we had to keep them cooled. And many of these reactions where you separate uh, important compounds of this type have to be carried out uh, either in a uh, uh, refrigerated atmosphere or uh, carried out in such a way that uh, so fast that you don't you didn't get a chance to uh, get this decomposition. So I tried to tried the uh, simple expedient of refrigerating uh, the solutions. And much to I ama my amazement, the the uh, uh, so the problem was solved almost immediately. If you kept the uh, uh, solution refrigerated, there was no decomposition. So therefore, at once, we had a possibility of precipitating the uranium out in very pure form, away from all of the other elements of the periodic table, because it was specific peroxide precipitation was thought to be specific only for uh, for uranium. Well, this uh, was a little too good to be true. Actually, it turns out later that uh, the rare earths are also precipitated by uh, peroxide and other things such as uh, 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 many of the transuranics, but since we didn't have transuranics at that time, we didn't have to worry about them. So for all practical purposes, uranium peroxide precipitation was very specific and it worked for this particular uh, purpose. So the question uh, uh, then arose 
as to what are the quantitative relationships uh, which will enable us to actually optimize the completeness of precipitation of the uh, uranium peroxide. And the variables, of course, are hydrogen ion or pH. The uh, other uh, variable is the concentration of the uh, peroxide. And there is a mathematical relationship uh, between those uh, called the equilibrium constant. And I decided to determine the value of this so that we could use this in our calculations. And with a simple series of uh, test tube experiments, uh, I uh, worked out uh, uh, by using, I think, about 20 test tubes and observing the effect in each one to be able to uh, uh, zero in on the approximate values of uh, the uh, pH and the hydrogen peroxide concentration and then develop a mathematical relationship uh, which enabled us to uh, calculate over a broadened uh, uh, number of uh, conditions and uh, was a, we were able then to optimize the uh, process for the proper conditions. A few years later, uh, the equilibrium constant was determined with great accuracy and it turned out to be within 1% of that uh, uh, value that I determined uh, by that rough method uh, uh, during a period of one, one day. So now essentially we were ready uh, with uh, the basic uh, experiments and uh, we were then ready to go to uh, uh, Oak Ridge. Oak Ridge, in the meantime, had been selected as the uh, uh, as the actual uh, locality uh, for carrying out the production of the U-235. Uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, uh, uh, was a, uh, located uh, in the hills of East Tennessee. Uh, there were uh, two small towns located uh, on the site, uh, uh, probably uh, as many as uh, 25 people in one town and 30 or 40 people in the other, so there was no great upheaval of uh, the locality. It turned out to be a very uh, fine locality and was selected uh, there for the production of U-235 by the electromagnetic method. Uh, also, it was selected uh, for the uh, site uh, over in another valley for the uh, uh, gaseous diffusion method of uh, separating uranium-235 isotopes, and then also as the pilot plant for the, uh, uh, for the uh, determination of the proper conditions uh, for uh, the separation of uh, uh, plutonium, which was carried out on the full scale at uh, Hanford, uh, Washington. Uh, at that time, the projects were very highly compartmentalized. And uh, although I was given a very high classification with regard to uh, the uh, amount of information available to us, uh, uh, incidentally, on our badges, uh, there was uh, a Roman numeral system whereby uh, you could immediately uh, tell at uh, what level of uh, detail of uh, technical uh, uh, consultation you could carry out. Uh, the lowest level, of course, was for the, uh, uh, the uh, workmen uh, around the uh, plant. Uh, who had nothing to do with the process uh, uh, involved in the pipe fitting and, uh, and the manual labor. And then there was a Category 2 for some of the operators, then a Category 3, which was for the supervisors, and then a Category 4, which was for more detailed uh, information, and the top category for the... Uh, uh, for the executive uh, people, uh, and I uh, was I had available uh, category four, uh, which after a period of a few months was raised to category five. 
So I had uh, all of the material that was necessary to carry out all of the work uh, at uh, the uh, electromagnetic plant. But uh, there was a category higher than that, which was reserved to only a few people who had access to all of the information that was going on in all of the products, in the gaseous diffusion product uh, uh, process, and the thermal diffusion process, and the, the uh, uh, uranium uh, plutonium uh, uh, reactor uh, process at uh, Hanford, uh, uh, but that was limited to only a few people. There were a fair number of us who managed to guess a little bit about what was going on and through rumor and a few other things, but the security was uh, quite remarkable and in spite of the fact that many people afterwards said they knew all of what was going on in actual experience, uh, uh, there were very uh, few of us, including myself, I did not know very much about the details of uh, the other uh, processes, and in more particularly, I didn't know at what stage they uh, had reached, except that uh, I knew that, uh, uh, for instance, when the reactors went into operation at Hanford, uh, I uh, received word uh, through uh, uh, more or less uh, rumor that uh, the temperature of the Columbia River was being raised, and so you could tell immediately that uh, the uh, project uh, had reached a very high-powered uh, stage. But uh, we were worried primarily about getting the uh, electromagnetic process uh, underway. My particular responsibility was concerned with the uh, chemical process, and at first I was given the title of director of the technical staff for chemical processes. And that meant I was uh, responsible for seeing that everything that had to do with chemistry was going all right. And uh, from the start, almost nothing was going all right. As soon as the uh, as soon as the uh, uh, mass spectrographs went into operation, and these were tremendous uh, uh, magnets uh, which were uh, uh, wound uh, in a uh, circular pattern, uh, and more or less resembling a racetrack. And there was uh, a, uh, a matter of about a hundred of these uh, uh, individual mass spectrographs, enormous things about uh, uh, you might say about uh, five to six feet uh, in radius, about 10 feet in diameter. And uh, uh, these, each one of these had a source uh, and a method of ionizing the, uh, uh, the uranium, uh, accelerating the, ra the uranium until it went into a, uh, uh, into an orbit and collect collectors were placed uh, to collect the U-235 at the 180 degree uh, point. And my first uh, job uh, was to uh, see that the U-235 was dissolved out of the collectors. And this now uh, turned out to be enriched material, which was enriched from 7 tenths percent U-235 to 15% U-235. Since the uh, amount of uh, enrichment that was necessary was something like 80 to 90%, it uh, was necessary to take that enriched material and put it through again. And we called the first stage through alpha and we called the second stage through uh, beta. But the first uh, complication we ran into was that uh, when we performed the original experiments uh, out at uh, uh, out at Berkeley uh, and we had all the best chemists there that we could, I can remember uh, one of the very fine chemists uh, who was actually a discoverer of carbon-14 and he placed uh, a stainless steel uh, 
uh, uh, piece uh, right where the U-235 was to be collected. And then uh, after a certain number of uh, hours, uh, the U-230 was collected on this uh, stainless steel piece. And then we took it, and I remember she is showing the experiment, uh, poured nitric acid over this stainless steel piece, and the U-235, uh, uh, which was collected on the stainless piece, dissolved magically away. And so we were, uh, from that simple experiment, it was assumed that the U-235 could be easily arranged with, uh, be dissolved with nitric acid and then purified uh, from that point. It turned out when uh, we went into production, the energy of the uranium ions was greater than that of our experiment, and therefore the uranium ions actually embedded into the stainless steel, and so that when we came to dissolve it out, less than 50% of the uranium-235 dissolved out. The rest remained buried inside the stainless steel. Well, you can imagine the, the uh, panic that ensued then. And uh, uh, I, had, uh, uh, I had seen this trouble coming from almost the first day. And uh, so I... Uh, tried to think of a way we could uh, get around this and uh, uh, thought back to my experience in electrochemistry as a graduate student and uh, thought, well, if we, uh, since the stainless steel does not dissolve in nitric acid, we can't uh, get the uranium out uh, practically that way and the other heroic methods would have contaminated and essentially dissolved the collectors uh, completely. And that was not practical. So I thought of the idea of coating the uh, box, the U-235 uh, collector box, uh, with uh, metallic copper, and we did that uh, by electroplating it. Then when the stainless, when the uranium buried itself into the metal, it buried itself inside the copper plate, then all you had to do was dissolve uh, the copper uh, outside uh, with, uh, uh, and with nitric acid. The copper dissolved very easily with nitric acid, left the stainless steel uh, uh, metal uh, uh, below untouched, and uh, then we, all we had to do was recover the uh, uh, uranium-235 from the copper. Now, uh, this turns out to uh, uh, to be a little difficult because uh, there was over a thousand times as much copper in solution as there was uranium. And, and no matter how uh, good your separations are, that does pose a problem. But it turns out that uh, uh, the large amount of copper actually uh, was a help because the uh, uh, ether extraction uh, from a saturated solution of uh, copper nitrate and uranium extracts more or less quantitatively the, uh, uh, the uranium into the ether layer. And then it, the ether layer can be easily stripped of the uranium, and you've got pure uranium. And uh, so, uh, actually, we had to devise uh, uranium extraction uh, uh, method almost uh, right as we were uh, doing this, as we were in the process. And I can remember the first experiments uh, where we tried this out, ether being uh, rather explosive and catches on fire easily, uh, we would, uh, I remember carrying out the experiments uh, and we'd keep one man there with a carbon dioxide fire extinguisher and, uh, uh, and we had to evaporate some of these things so we had a hot plate so we'd run into uh, uh, fires every, uh, small fires every uh, probably half hour or so, but they were easily put out. Uh, the only thing of it is that every time you used a fire extinguisher, there was a, 
procedure whereby you had to write up a report so that it was more trouble writing up the reports than it was carrying out the experiments, actually. So, but at any rate, we later found out other solvents other than ether, which were even better than ether. So we managed to solve the problem of getting the U-235 out, and instead of getting only 50% out, we got about 98%, which was, we perhaps would like to have done a little better, but was satisfactory. And so we then started piling up enough uh, enough of the fifteen uh, percent uranium to uh, uh, to make uh, to make this uh, uh, so-called beta process uh, possible. Well, now the uh, uh, when you come when you came to the beta process, uh, by now the material got to be very valuable. Uh, so, like a factor of one hundred to a thousand. So. You just couldn't afford to lose any of that valuable material, or you wanted to get at least 99% plus. So uh, there had been a, uh, a method worked out for the uh, precipitation and recovery of the uh, uh, uranium, because again, uh, you had to go through the same thing. You had to convert the uranium uh, which now was very valuable, 15% uranium in de-uranium tetrachloride uh, quantitatively, and that was worked out all right. And it had to be ionized and uh, separated again. And now when you collected it into the proper pocket, it was 80 to 90% uh, enriched uranium, which was suitable for uh, the uh, bomb project uh, for defense purposes. So uh, we were now on our way to actually uh, collecting material which could be used uh, uh, as, a, uh, as a weapon. Now, uh, the problem was that the method for, the determina for separating this out uh, was not as good as it should be. And again, the recovery was... Uh, uh, was regarded as, the low recovery was regarded as actually uh, potentially disastrous. It would mean that the whole process would uh, fail unless we could do better. So uh, I, in the meantime, as I mentioned before, I had worked out the basic chemistry of the direct peroxide precipitation, and that's where the direct process peroxide precipitation was brought into play. And when it was found out that we needed this, we had to junk all of the rest of the process equipment. And uh, in order to, since uranium peroxide does not filter well, uh, we had to separate it with uh, centrifuges. And so we immediately got the high priority uh, uh, order for uh, getting uh, all of the centrifuges uh, that the Sharples company put out, diverted to Oak Ridge, and actually flown in on, on bombers so that we could install it in the, uh, in the so-called beta chemistry process, and uh, uh, we fi it, it finally worked. How in many order to centrifuges were there that you had to bring in? The number of centrifuges that we had to bring in was not uh, all that uh, great a number, probably about 300 uh, centrifuges uh, uh, altogether, because they could be used uh, uh, not continuously, but they could be run and then emptied and then run again, and so it was. It worked out uh, uh, worked out quite uh, well. It did require a lot of labor, but. Uh, uh, with material at that point being worth uh, nominally, we figured a thousand dollars a gram. But, uh, it was uh, well worth it to uh, uh, to put all the labor and all the equipment that was uh, necessary. And of course, at that particular point, the volume of it was not uh, all that great. Remember, uh, we had to produce only one hundred kilograms uh, of 
this uh, in total. So uh, the uh, that process uh, really worked out very well, and uh, I did have quite a controversy because people were very loath to abandon the old process in spite of the fact that it wasn't working that well, uh, and so. I had to enlist some uh, rather influential friends in order to uh, make the decision go the right way. And uh, in that, uh, the, the British representative, who was uh, a vice president for research for Imperial Chemicals uh, of England, was there. He was a very, uh, uh, very outstanding chemist and chemical engineer. And he saw immediately that the process that I recommended would uh, uh, would be the best one to work. And then also uh, Dr. Krauss, uh, who was a former president of the American Chemical Society, very prominent chemist, he also uh, reviewed it and, and uh, said that this was the only process that really uh, would enable us to get uh, get it going. This required no, get the material away from the boxes. That is, this was uh, the only way that the recycle of the uh, that very valuable beta material uh, could be uh, could be accomplished. And uh, this was then uh, 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 christened not by me but by. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, by the, actually the, the plant manager who was delighted to see this problem uh, solved, he, uh, uh, he actually named it the Larson process. Uh, uh, and uh, it uh, really, uh, uh, really was uh, a source of delight to see that process uh, uh, finally work and deliver the uh, uh, to make certain that the uh, whole process would not come to a grinding halt because of so much material uh, being lost or held up uh, during the uh, recycle. And so there was a constant supply of this 15% material uh, being uh, made available to the Calutron so that uh, what was collected in the box, the 80 to 90% material, could then be uh, could then be actually uh, uh, turned into uh, uh, the the bomb material, which was uh, made available then, of course, to Los Alamos for the construction of the Hiroshima bomb. Well, uh, this uh, uh, there were a lot of other small problems uh, along the line. Uh, uh, but uh, most of them uh, worked uh, all right. And as the time uh, went along, uh, there were many problems over on the, uh, uh, on the side of the, uh, uh, the magnets and the, uh, and the sources and the receivers uh, over on, you might say, the physics side. Uh, they had their problems, but they were worked out uh, also at the same time. For a while, it looked like the magnets would would fail entirely because they were they kept shorting out because there was uh, metallic impurities left by the careless welders, and it looked like uh, the whole plant would have to be uh, uh, shut down. But they managed to uh, uh, pump oil through uh, these uh, big uh, coils and uh, get all of the uh, metallic particles which are shorting it out removed uh, in the uh, by filtering them out uh, and incidentally the uh, those coils which uh, went to make up the electromagnets were uh, wound with uh, silver uh, rather than copper because there was a shortage of uh, copper during uh, the war and also silver was a much better conductor and it turns out that uh, uh, there was uh, something like uh, about uh, uh, 
six, I believe it was something like uh, uh, over a billion, uh, uh, let's see, uh, no, the figure was actually 600 million ounces of silver were used in winding the coils for the electromagnets in the uh, Y-12 electromagnetic uh, plant. Uh, later on, when silver got to be $10 a pound and even higher, I reflected that there was over $6 billion worth of silver in those uh, coils. Could you tell us the story of how that came to, how the silver was obtained? The silver was obtained uh, uh, by uh, uh, virtue of the fact that, uh, as I say, there was not enough copper available for these big coils, and uh, Fort Knox had uh, uh, had all of this silver, and it was just sitting there. So uh, there was uh, the uh, Army Corps of Engineers just requisitioned the silver, much to the astonishment and dismay of the people at, uh, uh, at Fort Knox, but uh, it, was, uh, it was ordered and uh, delivered uh, in the proper form uh, for winding the coils. And today, this was not in the form of just wire because those, uh, those coils uh, were, uh, looked more like uh, straps, one inch wide and perhaps an eighth inch uh, uh, thick, as I remember. Uh, as a matter of fact, more than that, more like a half inch thick. And uh, I remember seeing uh, all of this silver uh, uh, when it was removed uh, from the uh, uh, from these electromagnets uh, piled up in one room, seeing hundreds of millions of dollars worth of silver in one room there. As I was later on, I was responsible for getting that silver back to the Fort Knox, and that was done uh, with some work, but not uh, with too much uh, uh, too much of a problem. Uh, wasn't it true? Excuse me for interrupting, but um, it seems to me that when the silver arrived in Oak Ridge, it was quite an occasion, and all you scientists uh, began to stay up overnight and. Uh, there was a whole weekend when no one saw any man involved in that problem because you were all down winding coils or doing something about the magnet because the silver had come. Uh, that, uh, that, I think that uh, particular story is, uh, is a, little, uh, uh, a little bit um, uh, mixed up because uh, uh, the actual winding was done uh, outside of Oak Ridge and then uh, shipped in, in in these great big uh, uh, magnet uh, boxes. Uh, but the big excitement was that uh, when they they started to be tested and we they were they were shorted out, uh, people worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, That's right. Uh, trying to to uh, get uh, the shorted material uh, out. Uh, the only time it really came to view was when we cut them apart uh, and removed the silver. Then it was viewed for the first time in Oak Ridge. Uh, but uh, how long after was that? Uh, that was about uh, two and a, two years, two to three years uh, after the uh, war was over. But uh, uh, there was no uh, no silver lost, as actually uh, it probably was far more secure at Oak Ridge than it ever uh, was uh, before or since at uh, Fort Knox. Because uh, in theory, it was poss it's possible to rob Fort Knox, but uh, it was never possible to uh, to take one of those great big uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, cases. Uh, and uh, and cut them apart outside of uh, an invasion by an army. But at any rate, uh, uh, 
there were a, a lot of uh, problems to be unraveled, and perhaps you could go on for. Well, I would dust, like to, uh, to interrupt one more time on that magnet uh, mm -hmm. story, which I think is so dramatic, and ask you: Did the, Dep the Treasury deliver? The silver to you in the form of those straps that were no the sil uh, the silver uh, was delivered uh, actually to uh, the manufacturer of uh, the uh, uh, those great big electromagnetic boxes and uh, and one and in the Who case was that? Uh, case was uh, this was Alice Chalmers I believe in the case of uh, the Alphas and Westinghouse in the case of the uh, of the betas uh, and uh, uh, those, and they fashioned the, uh, and uh, they they fashioned it. They they had to take the ingots and fashion them into the proper uh, size and so on. Uh, uh, of straps, which uh, were then straps, wound, which were then wound in the proper uh, uh, in the proper way to make to make the electromagnets. Uh, as I say, it was rather dramatic that there was that much. Uh, uh, silver tied up uh, for that purpose, but uh, it was it, the entire uh, 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 treasure it, it of the was, United States. It was uh, literally uh, probably ninety-eight percent of all of the available silver in the United States uh, uh, for put in there for that particular purpose. But since it was just being stored, uh, it, uh, it 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 performed a useful purpose rather than just sitting there during the war. So, but I, you're so modest. I do think. Um, do you think that today something like that could be accomplished? Even uh, well, uh, certainly uh, not in peacetime. Uh, in uh, uh, in order to get something like that done, uh, uh, the uh, probably it, it might take uh, uh, essentially years to unravel a red tape uh, uh, for such a what for such a transaction whereas in those days of course uh, there was uh, and rightly so there was nothing uh, that uh, was needed for the war effort that was left undone and fortunately the Manhattan Project had the top priority of uh, all of the projects much to the disgust of many of the uh, naval and army uh, and air force projects which were uh, uh, which were underway. Well, couldn't it also be said that to the credit of the Manhattan Project, all that silver to the last half ounce was returned? Yeah, well, of course, uh, 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 later on I became superintendent of the Y-12 plant. Uh, uh, in the in 1948, and at that time, uh, uh, we had the task of uh, returning all of that silver. And uh, for all practical purposes, uh, uh, as close as you could weigh it, it was 100 uh, uh, percent. At least it was 99.9. .9. <coughs> Toward the end of the uh, of uh, June and the beginning of July, it was very apparent that uh, we had a big effort uh, being mounted in order to scrape together all of the U-235 uh, that was uh, available. There was no uh, stone unturned to uh, get every milligram of U-235 uh, uh, delivered uh, to uh, Los Alamos. It was uh, uh, about July 25th that General Groves came to Y-12 and we had about 20 to 25 of the key people involved to meet together for lunch. General Groves was uh, usually a very uh, uh, 
hard-looking, hard-driving individual, a very little uh, apparent sense of humor, and uh, no uh, trace of uh, uh, humor in his eyes. However, at this particular luncheon, I have never seen a man in as good a spirits as uh, General Groves. In fact, uh, in looking at it, uh, in retrospect, uh, I would say that his uh, facial expressions on that day probably constituted a grave breach of security. It was obvious that he knew something that we did not know at the time. He, in his speech, indicated that uh, we are now certain of the success of the project which we have uh, which we had uh, so worked on for such a long time never a hint of what caused that great optimism on his part of course uh, uh, in retrospect we knew that uh, a little over a week before they had exploded a bomb at uh, Almogordo, and it was a complete success. And uh, whereas he showed in his speech no hint whatsoever of uh, this particular event, all of us were puzzled at the enthusiasm uh, which he showed. And, of course, it was only uh, about uh, 10 days later. It became abundantly clear to all of us uh, why he was so happy that day. Well, on August 5th, uh, uh, we, of course, uh, were uh, working uh, in our usual tasks in order to... Uh, uh, advance each one of the processes, refining everything, making sure that everything uh, worked uh, properly, ironing out bugs, of course, uh, which continued to uh, uh, arise. And suddenly into my office, someone burst in and said, they dropped the bomb. And I looked up, and of course, we had waited for this for a long time. And I, my immediate instinctive reaction uh, was to reply, did it go off? Always in the back of our minds was the fact that uh, there probably was no difficulty. Once you had U-235 in the proper quantities, that uh, you could uh, make the chain reaction uh, operate. What was concerning most of it, most of us, was the simple fact, would it go off and fizzle so that uh, there would really be uh, no effect? Well, the answer became abundantly clear in the announcements of President Truman, which came on all of the radios, that uh, the uh, bomb was dropped on Hiroshima uh, with the force of 20,000 tons of uh, TNT and that uh, as a military weapon, the bomb was uh, completely uh, uh, successful. And of course, uh, uh, about a week later, after uh, leaflets were dropped, and uh, there was no positive indication uh, that the Japanese were about to surrender. A second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, and of course, practically immediately afterwards, the uh, uh, Japanese uh, surrender negotiations uh, took place and hostilities uh, ceased. Well, this was a great a moment of great uh, relief to all of us, and uh, uh, we felt that our mission uh, had been accomplished. Well, after uh, this uh, 
uh, had been uh, uh, accomplished, uh, we began to review uh, the things that uh, uh, we uh, were doing and uh, what meaning uh, they, would, they had in light of the changed circumstances. It became very evident within a few months that uh, the uh, gaseous diffusion plant, which uh, had uh, uh, very limited uh, production up to the last few weeks of the, uh, of the end of the war, uh, now began to produce material with great efficiency and in great quantity, and the so-called alpha units were immediately uh, obsolete as compared uh, to what could be done with the gaseous uh, diffusion plant. Consequently, within a few months, the uh, alpha units uh, uh, were uh, uh, shut down and uh, left the electromagnetic plant only with the task of taking the uh, 12 to 14 percent enriched material from the gaseous diffusion plant and bringing it in the beta units up to uh, the required uh, uh, bomb strength or 80 to 90 percent. Uh, of course, uh, after this, within a year, uh, the gaseous diffusion plant showed the ability to take the material all up to uh, a bomb strength material and uh, it was uh, then uh, decided to shut down the, uh, uh, the plant, uh, the beta units, and uh, take on over only that part of the operations which had to do with the conversion to the tetrachloride and a few miscellaneous things, and continue work uh, on the research and development uh, on the uh, electromagnetic process uh, in case that uh, certain uh, uh, improvements might be made which would make it economical to, uh, to continue. Well, uh, as far as the chemistry was concerned, which was my main responsibility, uh, I decided we should take a look at uh, our whole operation and uh, see what other uh, purposes could be served uh, by uh, the skilled uh, chemists that we had uh, uh, assembled there. And uh, as a result of uh, several conferences uh, uh, which uh, we had, we decided that there were three areas which uh, could be uh, actually uh, uh, worked on with uh, great potential uh, profit uh, to the uh, whole nuclear energy effort. Uh, one of them was the, uh, uh, the task of separating isotopes by uh, uh, chemical means. And so we turned our attention uh, to uh, separating lithium-6 from lithium-7 uh, because lithium-7 had a very low cross-section and could therefore be used as a reactor coolant in the uh, program which uh, eventually might develop uh, to uh, use a reactor for uh, electric power generating purposes. Uh, another possibility of uh, great interest uh, was the, uh, uh, the great skill which had been developed in the uh, chemical research group uh, in uh, separation of, uh, of materials uh, uh, which had been really not been available any, uh, previously. And uh, uh, since the uh, group had acquired a great skill in solvent extraction, uh, the question was asked, are there better methods uh, for the uh, separation of uh, uranium 
from uh, the ores. Uh, it became very evident that as uh, uh, the uh, possibilities for the peaceful uses of atomic energy would develop, we would need uh, tremendous quantities of uh, uranium, and uh, those quantities would have to be from continually de decreasing uh, enrichment. In other words, when uh, the first materials uh, were had come from uh, the Belgian Congo or even some parts of Canada, uh, it was uh, sometimes possible to get 10 and 20 percent uh, ore. And uh, it became evident that as we went to the United States sources, uh, the uh, content of uranium would be below 1%. So uh, uh, it was decided to, to investigate better methods for, the, for getting uranium out of these ores. Uh, it soon became uh, uh, evident that there was a third very important problem so far as chemical separations were concerned, and that is uh, the need for highly purified uh, zirconium. Uh, it turns out that in nature, zirconium is always contaminated with a uh, sister element, hafnium, which is in, right below it in the periodic table. Uh, hafnium is extremely difficult to separate uh, from uh, uh, zirconium in fact, uh, it had been only done on an experimental scale uh, uh, with great effort of fractional crystallization and uh, literally hundreds of uh, stages were necessary to uh, purify the uh, zirconium away from the hafnium. Now, why is it necessary to uh, separate the zirconium from hafnium? Uh, in order to use zirconium uh, in the nuclear reactor, uh, it must uh, have the properties of having a very low uh, cross-section uh, and not uh, poison the reactor because of its absorption of uh, neutrons. And it turns out that all of the hafni, all of the zirconium which was available had uh, contamination by hafnium and was unsuitable. Uh, there is no more difficult uh, separation in the whole periodic table than the separation of zirconium from hafnium, and uh, therefore it was an extremely expensive operation. Uh, in order to do this by fractional crystallization, the cost would be over $100 a pound. Well, uh, it was decided to use the modern uh, techniques of solvent extraction, uh, which uh, would be uh, very much uh, more selective uh, in uh, uh, in its uh, uh, in its ability to uh, perform this uh, separation. The, uh, it was found that a thiocyanate complex of zirconium and hafnium uh, uh, ma uh, made it possible to separate zirconium from hafnium by countercurrent extraction to a purity never before obtained and at a cost uh, which was only one one hundredth of the previous cost of uh, fractional crystallization. This made possible the availability of zirconium for reactors, and it was the first use was made in the uh, uh, in the actual uh, uh, first submarine reactor, the Nautilus. And uh, I have here in my hand a small uh, example of uh, hafnium-free zirconium uh, metal which was produced uh, for the uh, uh, batches that went into the uh, uh, Nautilus uh, uh, fuel element uh, cladding and made possible really the fine fuel elements that the uh, Nautilus uh, had. This was all done 
by, uh, uh, by the extraction method and uh, all of it done uh, in our research and development laboratories which produced uh, all of the zirconium for the first uh, uh, nuclear uh, submarine. Uh, so there was one uh, triumph of new techniques of solvent extraction uh, for the separation of uh, uh, very difficult uh, materials. The, uh, the, next, uh, uh, the next important uh, problem uh, turned out uh, to uh, be uh, a rather unusual one in that uh, there never did develop a need for uh, 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 pure lithium-7. But for the weapons program, the, the, uh, uh, it became necessary to uh, uh, develop uh, a method whereby lithium-6 could be uh, delivered free from lithium-7 for uh, purposes, for uh, defense purposes. Uh, this was, uh, again, thought to be uh, very uh, expensive, but uh, it was found that a, uh, uh, a method uh, whereby the uh, uh, Countercurrent extraction again in a very special way uh, could be uh, used, and actually using some of the techniques that we used during the war, uh, it was possible to produce uh, very adequate quantities of uh, lithium uh, six uh, for defense purposes. And uh, there was a need for experimental reactors, uh, a certain amount of lithium-7, and this also was produced uh, by uh, uh, this particular method. Uh, with regard to obtaining uh, 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 cheaper methods for, uh, for getting uh, uranium uh, uh, out of ores, uh, again, solvent extraction, uh, uh, was very successful, and uh, the at one at least at one time, almost seventy five percent of the uh, uh, uranium which is produced in the world uh, used the uh, uh, solvent extraction method, uh, which was uh, developed uh, by this chemistry group uh, uh, in the uh, uh, in the electromagnetic plant. So, uh, starting from uh, a uh, conference held immediately after the war to determine the skills which this group could, uh, uh, could uh, apply themselves to, three tremendously important uh, uh, projects uh, were completed which had great economic significance uh, to the uh, whole nuclear energy effort and of great importance uh, to the uh, uh, defense uh, effort. So this, uh, this particular, at this particular time, uh, after the completion of some of these projects, uh, uh, I uh, was asked to become director of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and in 1950, I uh, assumed the responsibilities as director of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, there, uh, of course, uh, uh, I encountered a, a fantastic uh, number of, uh, of new, pro new problems. Uh, uh, Dr. Weinberg, who was a research director had organized a, uh, uh, a very fine program. Uh, uh, Dr. Wigner pre preceded him, uh, who also started the number of very important programs. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory had the responsibility uh, to, uh, uh, 
to help develop the so-called materials testing reactor, which was a uh, uh, reactor uh, which uh, was designed to uh, furnish a high flux of neutrons uh, and consisted of uh, uh, fuel elements of uh, uh, aluminum and uh, Aluminum and uranium, uh, which uh, 